What we're going to be uh, starting today, we're going to start a new uh, series. I was talking to Nathan, Nathan a couple, maybe it was two weeks ago, about starting a series where we kind of rotate and we're just going to go do some uh, expository teaching, which just means you're just going through a book of the Bible verse by verse. And so we're going to be starting going through the book of Romans. And then I'm going to be doing chapter 1 today, and then Nathan will pick up next week with probably chapter 2, uh, depending how far he gets or if I get through 1. But I think I'll be able to do that today. And so uh, it's going to be a little different. And then we're also going to have Jesse, who's not here today, obviously, uh, will be rotating, and he'll be doing something so we'll still have a, a, a little bit of variety because he'll be doing something different besides Romans. So I want to just pray again over the Word. Lord, we just thank you again for your Word. It's so rich. It's so deep. Lord, it's the words that we live by. So, Lord, I ask that you just grant us insight and wisdom. Lord, application to our lives. Because your word doesn't return void. So, Lord, I give you this day, I give you this service, in Jesus' mighty name, amen. Now, the background in Romans is that, obviously, Rome, Romans is written to the Roman church. Now, the Roman church was originally started by Jews who had come back from Jerusalem during the time of Pentecost. They'd come back. From Pentecost, been set on fire, started a church, and so that was the beginning of it. And then Claudius, the Roman Empire of the emperor, the Roman Empire, which obviously controlled the, the known world at the time, excluded all the Jews, told them they had to leave. And then when Nero came in, he brought them back, actually. So it went from being a, a basically starting out as a Jewish converts to being more Gentiles than Jews there. And that created some issues within the church. And so Paul is going to be addressing some of these issues. That's one of the reasons for his letter. Now, he's never been to Rome yet. So he's, he's writing this letter in response to letters he's receiving and information he's receiving from others. And so, um, because of this tension, we're just going to start and kind of go verse by verse through it. Verse 1, Romans 1, 1. It says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. You know, in that little short sentence, I think, you know, called to be an apostle. I always felt like I was called to be a missionary to Maui. Now, I don't know if that calling was really sure, you know. But in the case of Paul, I mean, it, that was not your everyday, well, I feel an unction from the Lord. I feel kind of a direction. I, you know, let's face it. As far as I look at it, what choices would, did he have? I mean, he's on the way to Damascus. As Saul, he's going to persecute the church. He's putting people in prison, persecuting the Christians. And then a light shines from heaven, and a voice comes, you know, and tells him, Paul, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, who you're persecuting. Now, would you or I go, well, I don't believe in you. Well, if you're kind of blinded, and you heard a voice, and you saw a great light. I didn't see a lot of, a lot of choice in there. So his, his calling was really unique. And it said, I've been set apart for the gospel. Of course, the gospel means the good news. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Regarding his son, who in his human nature was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the Son of God. 
and by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord, through him and for his namesake, we receive grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. And you are among those who are called to belong to Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be servants. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So first Paul is showing that Jesus is fulfilling the scripture of the prophecies about him. He's the son of David through the flesh. And although, as I talked about a couple, probably about a month ago, about how it was hidden from the Jews that, that it would be a, a, a suffering servant that was coming, they were expecting the Messiah, and he would be in the line of David and the things that he would do. Now, the gospel course, meaning good news, and I've often heard a lot of evangelists say, you must preach law before you preach the good news, because it's only when people realize they're guilty that they feel they have a need for a Savior. So for me, I think, well, I'm not, I wasn't near as bad as, as Nathan was, so I, I must be all right. Although the word says we all fall short of the glory of God. And if I was doing it, because Paul says, you know, I'm an uh, apostle to the Gentiles. And I thought, why would you do that? I mean, Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees, he says. He has exceeded beyond anyone in his group as far as knowledge of the Torah I would think he would be the one to be apostle to the Jews. Instead, he puts Peter, a fisherman, to be the apostle to the Jews. So, as I offer that advice to the Lord, I don't think he really needs my advice. But I'm just saying, and he always starts his whip, uh, his letters. Almost all his epistles, he always you know, starts with grace and peace to you. And you can only have peace, that shalom of God, if you know the, the grace of God. That you have been forgiven, that you, have, that you are again in right standing with the Lord, that you can actually have that shalom, that peace that passes all understanding. Okay, verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith has been reported all over the world. God, whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of his Son, is my witness. How constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. So even though he had not been there yet, he's constantly interceding for the Roman church. Also, all the other churches, some of those that he has started, he's constantly in prayer for them. And in verse 11, it says, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gifts to make you strong. That is, that I and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not wish you to be unaware, brothers, that I plan many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I had among the Gentiles." I am obligated both to the Greek and the non-Greek, both to the wise and the foolish, 
That is why I'm eager to preach the gospel also to you who are at Rome. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is of the power of God for salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, righteousness from God is revealed, righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So as he says, first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles, again, that goes back to our, our looking at the Deuteronomy 32 worldview that was a common worldview of the Jews. And I'm just going to read those couple verses out of Deuteronomy 32. And this is the, during the, again, the Song of Moses, where he's given the history of Israel and the history of the world. And he said, when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided up all mankind, he set up boundaries for the people according to the number of the sons of God. For the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted inheritance. So Israel was the Lord's allotted inheritance. And we can see that in the gospel uh, in Matthew chapter 10, where he sends out the twelve. Let me read that to you. So he calls the 12 out in verse 5 in the following instructions. He says, Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. So he first sends his 12, and then later he sends the 70, representing the 70 nations that were listed. And he sends them only to the Jews. Okay, then that all changes after the, after the crucifixion and the resurrection. Then he's sending them out in Matthew 28, the Great Commission. He sends them out to every nation, every tongue to spread the gospel, to recapture or to bring back into obedience the nations. And now we come to verse 18, which talks quite a bit about the wrath of God. And I think that's something we don't usually speak a whole lot about. He also, before I get to that, he did say, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And that comes from Habakkuk 2.4. So he, obviously Paul is very in tune with the Old Testament and just again showing how the Old Testament gave us glimpses of the gospel that was yet to come. So chapter 2 says, Therefore, or verse 18, I'm sorry, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what is may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature has been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. So he's pointing out the fact that through creation, it's evident that it did not come around come about because of a big bang or because of an amoeba somewhere that developed. It was obvious to the common sense of people that there was a creator. And then in verse 21, it says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their, thank, 
thinking became futile, and the foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds, animals, and reptiles. Okay, verse 24. Therefore, therefore God gave them over. Now, in the rest of this chapter, there's going to be three, three times he says the same thing. Therefore, God gave them over. So, in other words, it's like God is saying, okay, that's what you want? Have at it. Here you go. Go for it. And see how that works out for you. So, therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the Creator who was forever praised. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what not ought to be done. They have been filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossip, slanders, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They disobey their parents. They are sen- senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous degrees that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do them, the very things, but they also approve of those who practice them. So God's wrath is revealed. It's part of his nature, just like love, mercy, forgiveness is part of his nature. Also, his wrath is part of his nature. And you know where it said, man is without excuse. And then he talked about how God's wrath is revealed three times. Three times he says, God gave them over. It's kind of like a, a, a downward spiral of society and a culture as it begins to go downhill worse and worse. And then where he mentioned that these acts are unnatural, which today is, is called a hate speech. So again, that probably means this video will never go out. And there's also pressure in contemporary Christianity to emphasize the love of God and eliminate the wrath of God or the justice or the righteousness of God. But it's both. And so what he's outlining is how our culture and society today is, what's happened, what's going on, what this downward spiral. Now, he didn't mention anything in here about transgender or anything like that. I imagine he probably could not even at that time comprehend what would be going on. And so we have this degrading of ourselves. And it's like, you know, he he said in there that we know in ourselves. In other words, there's a conscience of most people. But as they continue to say no, as they continue to do that, eventually that conscience goes away. And they begin to get to that place where God says, okay, that's what you want. That's what we're going to give you. That's what's going to happen. And again, how that works out is not good. So it's a constant downward spiral, which is where I see us today as a society and as a culture. 
but God. So I want to go to Ephesians chapter 2, a couple of things I want to look up there. Ephesians chapter 2, I'm going to read verse 1 through 10. <clears throat> And it says, and you, and for you, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you used to live. Okay, as Lonnie was sharing earlier today, his first 30 years, it's where he was at, where a lot of us were at. We were living in our sins and our transgressions. When you follow the way of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, or many other places where Paul talks about the God of this age, the ruler of this age, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest... We were by nature objects of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in trespasses. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourself, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So as he's writing the church in Ephesus, that's what he's saying, all of us at one time were far from God. Many of us had to learn lessons the hard way because we lived our life like we thought we wanted to, and as a result of that, many times we, we paid a price for that. But God had mercy on us, forgave us as we gave our lives, as we acknowledged our, our sins, and as we repented, which means we turned a different way, we started walking a different way. We have that grace. Praise the Lord. In chapter 5 of Ephesians, I'm going to read the first 14 verses. It. it says, Be imitators of God because of results from what's been done for us that God has wiped our slate clean. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality, of any kind of impurity or greed, because they are improper for God's holy people. Nor shall there be obscene foolish talk, or coarse jesting, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of our God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. 
live as children of light. For the fruit of life consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what the disobedience do in secret. But everything is exposed by the light and becomes visible. For it is the light that makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Wake up, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine upon you. So we were once all in darkness. And, you know, there's an episode out of Luke chapter 7 that I want to read, starting in verse 36. It says, Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have a dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Now, when a woman who had lived a sinful life in town, she was a prostitute, learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume, and as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he thought to himself, he didn't say anything, but he thought to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know, know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. So Jesus answered and said, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said, two men owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and another 50. Now, neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he counseled the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who has a bigger debt counseled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house, and you did not give me water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has, performed, has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, her many sins have been forgiven for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. And I think we see that worked out many times in our, in our own lives. People who have been very good at sinners have done some pretty incredible bad things. But when they realize that and they realize their sins have been forgiven and they've made pure, white, spotless, they love much. They have a much greater attitude than some of us who might think, well, I really wasn't that bad. You know, we're all bad. We're, you know, human depravity is in all of us. And it's only by the grace of God and by his forgiveness and by his blood, his shed blood, And so you can only really know the good news of the gospel, really only if you understand that at one time we were all childs of wrath. Without excuse, as Roman tells us, totally depraved and without hope. For as the word says, for all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. So we have Romans showing us a picture of society, of a culture, of the downward spiral. But then we have the good news of the gospel, which shows us that through Christ Jesus, 
by receiving his blood, by receiving that forgiveness, that we can be made pure, white as snow. And so it's good news, even the bad news is good news. And so as we begin to watch our culture and we begin to watch this, this spiral downward, you know, we don't want to be surprised by it or necessarily even shocked by it because man without God, that's what you're left with. But it's in that darkness, you know, as Isaiah 61 says, you know, when great darkness covers the earth, rise and shine. It's our time to bring light in the midst of darkness. So Romans has a lot to tell us as we get farther into it. It probably has more in that book of doctrine, of church, you know, doctrine, which just means truth of the gospel than any other epistle. And it's it's really rich. I would encourage you all to read through it, pray over it, apply it to your lives because it outlines the history of mankind, but it also outlines the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. So let's go ahead and stand. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to have an opportunity for anyone who needs prayer, whether it's for healing, anything going on in your life you need prayer for, feel free to come up during this song. So, Lord, we just thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that, that, Lord, you have made a way. Lord, that left to our own devices, we are helpless. But, Lord, by your blood, by the things that you accomplished on the cross, we have life and we have eternal life. So, Lord, we thank you. And, Lord, we ask that you would strengthen us, Lord. Lord, in our walk with you, that we would walk worthy as saints, worthy before you, Lord, asking, Lord, that you would wash our minds by the washing of your word. Lord, that you would strengthen our inner man to be holy as you are holy. And Lord, I ask today, if there's anyone here who, who doesn't know you, who hasn't given their life over, Lord, who has not experienced that place of coming out of darkness into the light of the good news of the gospel, they'd make that decision today. And Lord, if there's anybody with sickness in their body that needs healing, we ask today that you would stretch forth your hand and you would touch the sick, Lord. You are the healer. You are the great physician. It is by the stripes of Jesus that we are healed. So, Lord, we receive your healing. We receive your empowering. And, Lord, we give you this day. And, Lord, as we bless our mothers and ask for a special blessing upon them, fulfill them. And, Lord, for each... uh, Lady that may not have children, we ask for a blessing upon them, Lord. We thank you for your faithfulness, your goodness to us. That, Lord, though every man be a liar, you are faithful. And, Lord, we thank you that you are patient with us, you're kind, and that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. So, Lord, we give you this day, ask that you be glorified in it. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.